Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice however we are and be glad in it. We welcome you to worship this morning. We are so glad that you are joining us on this special World Communion Sunday, um, a Sunday where Christians around the world gather at the table to celebrate the sacrament. And we invite you um, to bring your elements and at the proper time in the worship service, partake of your elements together as we celebrate the sacrament of communion. We also have a special offering that we're taking up today, our Peace and Global Witness offering, which the portions of the proceeds for that will go to help with peacemaking efforts around the world and within our own community. So please plan to give generously to that offering. We will also have a pet blessing today, um, this Sunday afternoon from 4 to 5.30. It's designed to be um, a drop off and come whenever you can pet blessing. Um, so come out and celebrate God's creation and God's creatures that love us and accept us no matter what. So all are invited to that, all types of animals, um, cats and dogs and lizards, and I'll even bless a snake. So um, all are welcome to come out to that event today at four. Friends, please join me in the call to worship. Welcome to this place where children and seasoned citizens sit side by side, where heaven and earth embrace in peace, where God has been, is, and will always be. Welcome to this place as we gather with all God's children where we find God's love, where we hear the tender voice of Jesus, where the Spirit teaches us new songs. Welcome to this place where all is made ready by God, where we bring our hunger and find food, where we bring our brokenness and find healing, and where we bring our very selves and find acceptance. Come, gather around the table, let us worship God.
Christ has spoken and seen him. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, past the world around, close abound. Christ is done to make us one, and the baby sets the tone, teaching people to live to bless, love and word and indeed express. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, past the world around, close abound. Jesus pulls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt. Gives us love to tell, bread to share, God in heaven and everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, past the world around. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, as the world around holds Friends, please join me in the prayer of confession as we confess our sins against God and neighbor. Let us pray. Lord, as we prepare to break the bread and drink from the cup, we cannot help but hesitate to partake of your body and blood. We remember your admonishment to go and be reconciled to our siblings before coming to your table. We recognize how we have fanned the flames of division rather than repaired the breach between us. We know we do not make evident our unity in you our oneness made possible through your sacrifice. Too many of your children do not have a place at the table, do not have enough to eat, and beg for crumbs when you command us to offer radical and abundant hospitality. In your re relentless mercy, forgive us and free us from fear and make us conduits of your reconciling love. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God refuses to give up on us. God restores us. God sent God's only son to save us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, in Christ and in Christ alone, we are forgiven. Amen. Mr. Todd here. In today's Bible passage, it talks about Jesus being like an important stone. And that's a little confusing. So let's explore that idea together. I'll bet you've worked with blocks like these. They're all exactly the same, perfectly alike. But in Bible times, when they would build not all of the stones were exactly the same. Some were different sizes. Some were stronger than others. And you needed a really perfect stone to be the very first stone that you would use to begin your building. Well, Jesus said he is like that first stone, the corner stone. Now, some people weren't ready to put their faith in Jesus. They rejected him. But Jesus said they needed to make him first in their lives. That if they would build on him, the solid rock, everything would be all right. With Jesus, we can do all things, but without him, things can come tumbling down. So 
Jesus said he was the cornerstone, but the word that he used, some people believe meant something else. They believe that he said he was the keystone. Now, both are important stones, but this is what a keystone does. The cornerstone is the first stone you put down. A keystone is something that you find in an archway. So when building an arch, rather than the first stone, the keystone is the last stone, the capstone that would hold the arch together. It's the one that would bear all the weight to keep the arch strong. In this way, Jesus was saying that he was the final piece of God's plan to bring us salvation. So whether you understand Jesus as the very first one that we build our lives on, or as the very last one who completed God's plan, both are helpful. Now, Jesus is our rock and our foundation. He is the one who completed God's plan to save us from sin, Jesus. So today is World Communion Sunday. And on this day, Christians all over the world receive Holy Communion. As Christians do this everywhere, we are celebrating and remembering Jesus, knowing that we all love and trust the same Lord. We agree that he is most important. We remember and celebrate that he came back to life after dying on the cross. We remember that he takes our sins away. And we remember that he gives us power to live this life here on this earth and forever in heaven with him. Join me in a word of prayer as we praise Jesus for who he is and what he's done. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you are the cornerstone. You are the keystone. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are the most important to us and to believers all over the world. Amen. Today's lesson is Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. 
They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Friends, let us pray. Everlasting God, open our ears to hear your words for us this day. Guide our feet as we take steps towards peaceful action. Empower us to take care of the gifts you have entrusted us with. Be our great rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, today we are wrapping up the season of peace. A season when we are reminded that peace is active and not passive. And peace is in doing and not waiting. As we've followed through the daily devotionals over the past four weeks, we have examined the ways God calls us to peace within, peace in our relationships, peace in community, and holistic peace. And then today, we come to this text that rings of everything that is opposite of peace. We have murder and stealing and greed, all of which go directly against God and God's creation. Now, there are many important points Jesus uses this parable to teach us, but because of time, Today, I want to focus on how Jesus uses this parable to remind us of two important things. The first is God has immense love and provision for creation. Tenants of creation are invited to enjoy and love creation as well. In marching band, we always had this saying that went, leave it better than you found it meaning you pick up your own mess, your mother doesn't work here, as well as you make sure that the space is left better than it was when you arrived. In today's text, God, the landowner in this parable, gets his land in proper order with all the tenants could need for producing fruitful and abundant harvest. God has trusted them to care for what has been provided. Because what has been created is sufficient for the landowner, the landowner can step away and trust the action of the tenants. Or can they? And all does and goes well. Until it comes time for the landowner to receive a part of the harvest that is due to him and the tenants don't want to let it go. I once again appreciate Pastor Debbie Thomas's words on this text. She points out what the tenants in the story neglect to understand or very deliberately choose to ignore is that they are stewards rather than owners of the vineyard. When the landowner asks for his rightful share of the harvest, the tenants take offense, as if the vineyard belongs to them. And it is the landowner who is wrong for making a claim to the land at all. Somewhere along the way, the tenants have forgotten their place, their vocation, their standing relationship to both the land and the landowner. To put it bluntly, they have forgotten that they own nothing, nothing at all. Everything belongs to the landowner. Theirs is not a vocation of ownership. It is a vocation of caring and tending and safeguarding and cultivating and protecting on behalf of another. It's worth pointing out here and noting that Jesus does not describe the evildoers in the story as either thieves or bandits. They are not outsiders at all. They are the landowner's trusted tenants. The landowner chose them and granted them creative license to steward the vineyard for the benefit of all. How much more tragic then when they abuse the landowner's trust so cruelly. 
Debbie Thomas compares this to how humans mess up when it comes to being stewards of creation, citing fires and raging hurricanes and climate change. As a Christian, I do believe that the earth will be renewed and restored, that somehow God's coming kingdom will bring healing to all, even to all of creation. But I don't for one minute believe that we, the stewards, are somehow off the hook because the landowner will ultimately reclaim the vineyard. Friends, our vocation is lifelong and our relationship to the landowner is eternal. Unfortunately, reclaiming the vineyard will always meet with opposition from those who have vested interest in keeping the vineyard broken. So our calling isn't even close to over when we hoard, exploit, abuse, and ignore the work of God's hands, we wound and reject God's very heart. Now this week, Christians around the world will celebrate the feast of St. Francis of Assistance, commemorating the life of the 12th century monk who deeply cared about creation. And on Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, on the walking mall, we will bless the animals recognizing God's care for creatures that live among us and the valued companionship these creatures bring to our lives. We will confess that we are not always the best tenants or stewards of creation. We may also pray for the Book of Common Worship's prayer, saying, this fragile earth, our island home, this year, perhaps more than ever before, I think many of us will flinch at this adjective, fragile. We are reminded of how fragile our earth is when we watch the West Coast engulfed in fire. A pastor friend of mine from California laments reading this very text in her context because the fire destroyed all of Napa Valley's grapes. Friends, so much around us is fragile. Our time is fragile. Our lives are fragile. People who surround us in community are fragile. And the very earth we live on is fragile. If nothing else this week, friends, perhaps we just sit with the possibility that we own nothing. Not this planet, not our churches, not even our own lives. All of it is God and all of it is precious beyond reckoning. But the fact that God trusts us to steward any of it, us, that is pure miracle. Which brings us around to Jesus' second point. We can be our own worst enemies. We will talk ourselves out of the best things that are right before us. I can even imagine that over the year as the tenants are tending the land and caring for the vineyard, they begin to talk amongst themselves, bemoaning all of the labor they are pouring into the success of the vineyard, getting themselves all worked up, deciding they will defend themselves and the harvest against anyone who might come and lay claim to the fruits which they have labored for so hard. And so when the slaves are sent to receive what is rightfully the landowners, they beat, kill, and stone them. Not only the first set of slaves that come, but the second. And then they become even more greedier. And as the landowner's son approaches, they see a chance at receiving not only the harvest they have produced this year, but the son's inheritance as well. So they kill him. Jesus' point is that the people, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and us, God's chosen tenants of creation, for whom God has prepared a beautiful, abundant, living creation, will destroy it. We will disrupt the peace provided when at all possible, to the point of killing the prophets whom God sends, and to the point of killing even God's own son, Jesus. We try desperately to make creation our own, to reject the stone that is offered to us as the foundation. But what do we do now? 
How do we ensure we are bearing fruit? How might we live as faithful stewards? Will we embrace those in need or shun them? Will we use our privilege to work for greater equality and justice for others or to secure our own futures? Will we extend the peace of Christ to our neighbors in need or quietly turn our backs on the beloved children of God? Caring for the kingdom of heaven is not only about being good tenants, the kind of tenants who tenaciously and faithfully tend to the call of being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Friends, caring for the kingdom of heaven is being tireless in our resistance in others and in ourselves to leadership which works to undermine the Beatitudes. Tenants who exercise justice to work for a world where the Beatitudes are not just aspirational, but actually possible. In the same way we do not own Christianity, we do not own the table of peace that is offered to us through Jesus Christ. We are not the land owners. We are not God. And thanks be to God for that. We are invited to partake in the harvest and join in the good works of God and even in our good works as stewards of God's creation. But these days are hard. Many Days feel like being shaken up in a snow globe with no way out. You're being challenged by the world and challenged in worship. So let us not be stirred up and left without hope. Let us look to the landowner. Let us welcome the sun. Let us share the fruit that is God's creation so that all of God's creation can flourish. And I encourage you to take just a moment in the midst of all the swirling around you to stand still, to plant your feet firmly on the ground, outside or near a window, at a place where you could take in more than just what is in your possession and take in the world. Invite God to show you the expansiveness of God. Invite God to remind you the ways God is working in the world and how you can be a part of that. Tending to the creation which God has entrusted to you. God has immense love and provision for us. Jesus is extending the path of peace to us today and every day. An internal peace peace for our relationships, and peace for our community, an all-encompassing peace. All we need to do is come to the table of peace and receive the harvest. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, Hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed people, that this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Awaken all people to the danger we have afflicted upon the earth, implant in each a reverence for all you have made, that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by their teaching and example, they may reveal your love for all people. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble, sorrow, poverty, sickness, and grief, especially those known to us whom we name before you now in silence. 
Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. Bring to remembrance all of those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our giving is one way of saying thank you to God for what God has given to us. It's an act of gratitude. It is also an act of worship. Just as we present our words in liturgy and song and prayers to God, we present a portion of the fruit of our work to God, our money. May we reflect on what we have been given and respond by giving generously to the work of God through this community. Oh! 
Come as you are. Come as you are. to this table and celebrate World Communion Sunday. We come with Christians near and far, Christians all around the world, to celebrate the sacrament. So I invite you to hear these words as we prepare our hearts and minds to come to God's table. Friends, we gather around the table in places far and near, in our homes and in our church parking lots, we are all invited to the table, eating sourdough and rye, tortillas, crackers and wafers and Wonder Bread, the body of Christ, drinking the wine or the juice from handmade chalices or silver goblets, golden spoons and from mini cups, the blood of Christ. The bread and the cup unite us with all who would follow Jesus. This meal reaches back through the centuries. This table reaches all around the world. Everyone born has a place at God's table. It is not our table, but the Lord's. So friends, let us pray. Rising sun, soaring spirit, radiant Lord, you are here, you are with us, you are in shining glory. You meet us in the breaking of the bread and you pour the wine of salvation. You feed us with grace and overwhelm us with love. By your spirit, make these gifts your body and blood. By your spirit, make us one with you and with each other. By your spirit, make us strong that we might share your love with a blessed and broken world. Lord, come among us this day, we pray. Amen. Friends, we give thanks that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they have had eaten, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And friends, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. Friends, I invite you to celebrate the sacrament. Amen. Friends, receive this benediction. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. <laughs>